Well, welcome back. Uh, we're here in the gallery where the gold exhibition is displayed and, and congratulations on a wonderful exhibition and a fabulous film as well. So generous with information and, and the collection items. Um, what we're going to do is begin by asking you to say a little about yourselves and, and your role here at the British Library and then we can talk a bit about, about the genesis of the show and, uh, and what you've learned from putting it together. So why don't we start? I know you've just introduced yourselves through the film, but, but once again, uh, Eleanor, can you begin and say a bit about your, your, your job here at the BL? Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm Eleanor Jackson, and I'm curator of illuminated manuscripts in the Western Heritage Collections here at the British Library, and I'm one of the co-curators on the Gold Exhibition. Thanks, and Kathleen? I'm Kathleen Doyle. I'm the lead curator of Illuminated Mas Manuscripts in the Western Heritage Collection, which means that we look after the books and pictures in them. So, a bit of a fortunate task. <laughs> Coming from Western Europe, so in Latin, in Romance languages, and in, and in Greek. Great, and Annabelle? Well, I'm the, Annabelle Gallup. I'm the lead curator for Southeast Asia in the Asian and African collections in the British Library. But I'm really um, here, my, one of my roles as curator, co-curator of this exhibition is to um, gather together the expertise of all my amazing colleagues in Asian and African collections who have all contributed to this exhibition. One of the great things about the film that we've just seen is it's really revealed to us how many contributors there have been. We've you know, heard from a lot of your colleagues. I'm sure there are many more as well. My first question for you really, and maybe um, Eleanor, you can take this one, is, is about the genesis of the show. How did this show come about? It's quite an unusual venture, I think, for the British Library to draw together material from such a large span of time in so many different languages and cultures. And, and it, it's fascinating to see them all brought together. So can you tell us a little bit about how it came about? Yes, yeah, so we wanted to put on an exhibition about gold because it is such a consistent feature of bookmaking traditions around the world. Um, not only consistent in the techniques that were used to apply it, but also in the meanings that um, people used it to express, especially meanings of value. You know, books are um, a medium of communication and nothing communicates value like gold. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to um, do this exhibition to explore those connections through some of our most beautiful and gorgeous manuscripts. We celebrate, celebrate that. And I mean, it's not the first show to open at the British Library since the, all of the lockdowns and privations mm -hmm. of the pandemic. But one of the things going around the exhibition, and I'm sure has really come across to mm -hmm. people watching this from the film, is just how kind of shimmering and kinetic and wondrous it is. I mean, it's like an exhibition of things that can't really be digitized. And I mm -hmm. wonder, how did you, how did you choose the, um, the items for display? I mean, presumably, a lot of the heavy lifting of putting this show together was done when you were all working far from <laughs> the British Library in your own homes with variable personal Wi-Fi and so forth. So can you say a bit about, how, yeah, how did you choose the, the items? And, and yeah, what, what led to the, to, the, um, to the groupings that you have here? Yeah, who would like to answer that? Sorry, well. Annabelle, why don't you? Yeah. All right, then, well, y yes, so as you said, well, the work had started before lockdown, but it was, um, and as soon as we were allowed back into the British mm. Library, we came in and to start looking at the actual manuscripts themselves. But of course, there were restrictions because of the pandemic. And so one thing we couldn't do, which, um, which we had thought would be essential for any exhibition, is to look at things together. So mostly we were looking at things individually and trying to think, is this good enough? Because this is an exhibition of stars. Everything that you see is a star in its own right. Um, but it's really, we've actually learned so much. It's only here in the gallery, as we put things out, we suddenly thought, oh my goodness, Look at the Golden Haggadah mm -hmm. next to the Queen mm -hmm. Mary Psalter. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they work so well together. And for example, in the we especially Ellie had especially chosen the seal of the Emperor Baldwin, the 13th mm. century um, R Roman Emperor, mm. and the, his seal is actually of gold. And it was only when we installed it in the case we realised that just above it we'd also shown two commissions issued by the last King of Myanmar, King of King, King of Burma, Tibor 
um, with his own royal seal also stamped in gold. So there were all sorts of synergies which actually hadn't struck us until the exhibition came together in the gallery. And that's one of the most exciting things that I think we've all found. Yeah, do you, I mean, I wonder if it sets a kind of n new kind of precedent for working together across the library as well. I mean, the, the, one of the really extraordinary things about this show, and I, I, I wonder how obvious it will be to, to visitors going around, is that 100% of mm. the items on display in this exhibition are parts are in the British Library's own collections. I mean, from it's a very, very um, broad collection here at the British Library. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. And uh, yeah, I mean, there aren't that many um, uh, collections, I suppose, in the world that could have generated this. And um, yeah, yeah, I think it, you know, as Annabelle was saying, that was sort of result of of working during lockdown because we had initially thought that we would like to have some loans. But you can't ask for something you haven't seen, and it was, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, I think we're all a bit surprised mm -hmm. at how well things work together. And one of the comments that we had at our, our non-virtual opening <laughs> last week, that so many people came up and said that the juxtapositions mm -hmm. are really fascinating. Mm -hmm. As you comment, like, well, well we're here. We're, <laughs> it's amazing. If, run I, of can, if I can be it. afforded a, a, a favorite case, but <laughs> each of these uh, manuscripts from different traditions, in different languages, different time periods, and all of a sudden you see them together, and it's not just the wow factor, but I think other more subtle themes mm. start to, to start to emerge. Mm. And it is an exhibition that we could have done, you know, three times over mm -hmm. because we have so many incredible manuscripts in our collection. And we started out with a long list that, you know, it probably was three times the length of what we have, if not more. Um, and so it was a lot of work to hone it down to the 50 objects we have on display. Mm -hmm. And partly it was to do with balancing items from different cultures, different traditions, languages, etc. And partly to do with choosing objects that would um, complement each other nicely, both visually and thematically. You can imagine the spreadsheets. <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine spreadsheets, but the other thing that I can imagine, and, and, and I experienced this, you know, just teaching uh, online throughout the pandemic, was that no matter how wonderful your screen is, and no matter how mm -hmm. brilliant the mm -hmm. digital images that you have at your disposal, it, it, the you know everything is screen size, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. one mm -hmm. of the things when you're planning an exhibition, it's so easy to forget, even if you know perfectly well how big something is in real life. Um, and one of the things that I think is so fascinating about this exhibition isn't just the chronological scale and the range of languages, but the, the scale that we mm -hmm. see, which ranges from really very tiny, uh, um, ornate little books that are like jewelry, mm -hmm. all the way through to a manuscript that unfortunately is off camera, but it's all, you know, almost, I think it's taller than me, um, uh, which, yeah, I mean, uh, did that, was that presumably one of the things that you also wanted to put across, was the incredible range of objects that, that um, are used uh, with, um, with kind of golden embellishment? Yes, absolutely. And I mean, you brought up the um, subject of how things look different on screen, and of course, Gold is one thing that mm -hmm. is classically incredibly difficult yeah. to digitize. You know, the library's done a huge amount of work in digitizing manuscripts, and I think most of the items on, in this exhibition are digitized and available to view online, but you just don't get a sense of the gold in images. You know, you have to see them in person and to see the way the light moves on them. Um, they're something that that only really work in person. Yeah, the multidimensionality. Well, actually, I do think that they work. In the film, I think mm. you can see that the yeah. moving camera actually mm -hmm. is yeah, capable really of, tra good. of transmitting, yeah. I think, yeah, surface textures and light. glitter. But the other thing, too, is that until electrification, all, all of the, you could see mm. it by daylight mm. or moonlight, mm. I suppose, mm. but also by, by mm. flickering candlelight. candlelight. And yes. I think that you know some things get flattened mm. out with, mm. with light mm. bulbs as mm. well. Mm. So the exhibition, you mentioned the, the, um, the, it opened a week ago. It's been open for a week now. I mean, Kathleen, can you say a little bit about the initial response to the, to the show? What have people been making of it? I think we're all so pleased, mm. aren't we? Because yeah. people have seen what we hoped yeah. they would see. We've had some really wonderful reviews. Mm. Um, 
some of the journalists we had stayed with us for and, and just stayed and talked and looked at things, but I think we've had several four and five star reviews. And I hope that other people can come as well and see them in person because it does, I, I think it, it causes many people to think we have some of the most famous things in the collection, as you will have seen. But sometimes next to something that's never been shown before yeah. has, is very little studied. Mm -hmm. And uh, so even if you're an expert in one type of mm -hmm. book, you're going to see something that will surprise mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I certainly did. I mean, the juxtaposition just in the mm -hmm. case behind us, mm -hmm. I think there is a manuscript in Greek, there's two in Latin, mm -hmm. and there's one in Hebrew. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, those are language groupings that are so often estranged in library catalogs, aren't exactly. they? So yeah, I, it's really wonderful that it's had such a, a warm response. And, um, and I'm sure we'll say this again, but it's open until the 2nd of October. So everyone watching, you'll have an opportunity, <laughs> I hope, to, to come and, and see it for yourselves. So I think we're hoping to have, be able to field some questions from people who are watching this live. Um, and there is, I think, a little question box uh, somewhere on your screen that will enable you to, to pose questions. And actually, I can see <laughs> the magic of screens. <laughs> I can see that um, that I've got one uh, here um, from John Stuart Gordon who is asking about the, the pigments in the manuscript. So I'll just read his question. Were the other pigments, the blues, reds, greens of related value, um, a, a, a sort of equivalent value to the gold? And did the use of one sumptuous material necessitate the use of equally sumptuous materials? That's a, a, yeah, That's a good question. Because yeah. gold, we think of mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the most valuable pigment. Mm -hmm. But was it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ellie, do you want to take that one? Well, I guess the first thing to say is we don't know exactly what pigments were used in any individual manuscript unless we've done scientific testing on them, which for the vast majority of our, our manuscripts, we haven't. So. It's a tricky one to answer. Um, I know that lapis lazuli, for example, is said to have been, I think it's equivalent value to gold, mm -hmm. that those are the mm -hmm. two most valuable pigments, mm -hmm. um, both precious, um, well, stone and metal, both were imported very long distances before they were used in manuscript production often. Um, and often used together. Um, you know, there's a lot of manuscripts in the exhibition that are the, the gold and blue palette. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose it stands to reason that if you're using one extremely valuable mm -hmm. pigment in a manuscript, you're mm -hmm. going to um, use similarly valuable um, materials for the others as well. In the, in the film, Hamish, I think, made some really, really important points about labor yes. mm -hmm. and the labor of yeah. the um, extraction of materials and, and the production of them. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that's another thing that comes across is that mm -hmm. the material in itself has a kind mm -hmm. of a value by weight, mm -hmm. but the transformation of those materials mm -hmm. into paintings mm -hmm. by skilled artisans is, mm -hmm. you know, a, a kind of another, I, th I suppose, form mm -hmm. of value that really comes across throughout the exhibition is that, mm -hmm. you know, any fool can have a lump of lapis lazuli. <laughs> it takes a, a really skilled artist to grind it in the right way, bind it with a medium and apply it to the page, doesn't it? Yeah. But I think yeah. the interesting thing is that lapis we know only came from one site in Afghanistan and that was one reason for its very high cost that it had to travel so far. Mm. I think that the other interesting thing that Hamish also brought out is that it's not possible to tell where the gold comes from mm. in each of these manuscripts yeah. because gold was used and reused and circulated in the form of gold coinage, which could then be melted down. So it's, um, one does look at all these wonderful manuscripts mm. and just wonder where the gold comes from. But, but it's, yeah. it's something about the aura of gold, it's so mm. pure, it is. is that it's so difficult to trace. Yeah, it, mm. and also I think it, um, whether we know exactly where the um, particles on the page came from, yeah. there can be no doubt that they uh, reflect incredibly complicated trade networks that mm -hmm. connected the cultures that we're seeing in the cases, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. And on the pigment front, you've, you've seen in the film some expert, uh, excerpts from uh, about a two-minute film that um, Patricia Lovett and one of our cons uh, bookbinding conservators did for us, and, and in 
people have also said how interested they are, I think including your husband comment, <laughs> that you, to say, oh, how, how are they? How are these? How is it applied? How do you get into books? How do you make a gold ink? How do you write a whole book in yeah. gold? It's, so that, yeah. that's a nice aspect that we wanted to explore as well, the origin mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. the technique and no, it, how I mean, is it done. Pre-modern scientists were often so interested in alchemy, the turning of base metals mm -hmm. into gold. Yes. But the funny thing is that actually there's another kind of alchemy, which is turning gold into <laughs> books and manuscripts <laughs> and objects and bindings and so forth, yes. which is, is really fascinating. So there's another question here from Yoko saying, thank you so much for this amazing private view. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> and her question is, do you have any plan for the future to organize Gold 2, oh, uh, <laughs> an exhibition with, uh, with the long listed items that you have, which missed them? And if so, she says it would be really wonderful. So Gold, the second album, uh, is, is that in the works? I think we're already compiling the list of all yeah. the things that, you know, that we couldn't fit in this time round, certainly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as you know, we've got two galleries and this is the smaller of the two spaces, which is why we have only 50. And as we were working on it, I think the, the others, the bigger space did loom. But on the other hand, then you really do need to enhance it with other sorts of objects and more lines. Yeah. And to be able to, I mean, to be, make a sort of a pun, but it is a kind of a jewel mm -hmm. of, a sm of a, just a small, very focused, very, hope, 50 beautiful. objects is, is actually, I mean, it, it, I mean, <laughs> it is a lot, I think, and, and it invites, I think, kind of close and careful looking. I think there's another thing in, um, in that question, which is about how materials allow you to cut across the collection in some mm -hmm. really interesting ways. And I know you mentioned lapis lazuli and blue, which certainly mm -hmm. connects Europe to mm -hmm. the kind of the mountainous range around in and around Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which is where I think we think it was mostly mm. sourced in the Middle Ages. And it's probably a bit mean to <laughs> say, let's brainstorm other materials <laughs> that could let us do that. But I think, mm. you know, even you know, even very ordinary inks, I think, could could help to tell some of those transcultural and trans so gold too, or some other, you know, material of, of note. Um, Okay, I'm going to ask another question. Um, this one from from uh, Raymond Lamb. Thank you for an inspiring and very interesting tour. Well, on behalf of everyone involved, thank you, Raymond. Um, the Buddhist manuscripts from Thailand and Myanmar date to the 19th century. Do we know how early back gold was being used for Theravada texts in these regions and cultures? Mm. That's a good question. Yes, it's a very good question because manuscripts on paper and organic materials from Southeast Asia don't exist um, from a long time back. The earliest manuscripts really only date from the 17th century onwards. That is manuscripts written on paper. So um, that, that will explain why the ones we have on display in the gallery are um, from the 19th century. But when you think that the oldest items in the entire exhibition are two gold strips from Myanmar. Their Buddhist chants written in Pali in the Pew script, um, which would have been rolled up and um, placed at the base of a, of a stupa, which was being constructed to, um, to symbolize the presence of the Buddha. When you think that gold, the association that go, gold was used for writing the most precious sacred texts already at that early period, it does suggest that um, gold was also used for manuscript illumination, but we simply um, don't have any examples extant yeah. today. And remarkable survivals, mm. those two. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I wonder, looking at them, if, the, if part of their message is that the gold is valuable, but the text more so. I mean, is that mm. ultimately what is being said, is that the preciousness of the, of the words or the messages are somehow more valuable than the material things? Or maybe that's... I mean, Maybe. I'd like to think that, but these were probably um, um, acquired after following. They were just discovered by villagers digging, and they were, you know, things like that come up through archaeological investigations. Sure. I think that I think the problem with gold is that it is so versatile that mm -hmm. most gold um, manuscripts or inscriptions were very quickly melted down and reused for other things. So mm -hmm. actually, it's more the Interestingly enough, there's an inverse proportion. So gold on 
gold used in small quantities in books will probably survive for many mm -hmm. centuries, but the ultimate gold manuscripts are very, very susceptible mm -hmm. to being um, recycled. See, re recycle, recycled and being yeah. valued more for their material rather than their words. Yeah, and when, when you have um, gold leaf, which, you know, as I think you and also with the help of Patricia Lovett explained, is beaten out to these almost impossibly mm -hmm. thin foils, it's actually very difficult to reuse it in, in that form to kind of scrape it down and, and mm -hmm. make it... Uh, yeah, make it into something else. But but you're right, these solid gold objects um, must have been irresistible once people found them. Yeah. Okay, um, another question. Um, well, this one's a very open question. So if nobody would like, if you don't want to do this, then just say no. But the question is, can you talk a bit more about the inscriptions on actual pieces of gold? I think these are some of the most surprising and astonishing um, artifacts in, in this show, is like that a manuscript can actually be a solid piece of, of metal furled up. Um, yeah, do you have other kind of reflections on that beyond what you've already well, actually, shared? Well, actually, we've got um, it, we've got this one one wonderful case where all the golden objects are gathered, and and it shows what a range of texts there are. There are sacred um, Buddhist um, chants in Pali. There's a secular letter from the princes of Bali to the Dutch governor. There are there's a treaty um, signed between the. Um, between the, 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 the king of um, Calicut and the Dutch East India Company. And there are two gold commissions issued by the ki last king of Myanmar to um, an underling, but making him an overlord of two mm. townships. So I think you can see the range of uses mm, yeah. that they've been put to. And perhaps in, with, in the same case is, um, is an extraordinary. Yes, one of our other mm. really early items mm. is uh, just a fragment. You could see it in the in the film of a canon table, so a sort of concordance that um, would list passages that are the same in a Greek gospel book that's oh, painted gold and then painted on top of that. So uh, it was almost as early as the yes, Burmese I think it's, and, as yeah. it's, it's Burmese dated uh, six to seventh century, so mm -hmm. it's right yeah. around the same yeah. time. And it's interesting; those canon tables—they're so astonishing, but they're also, in effect, an index. It's like the most glamorous <laughs> index, <laughs> the most unimaginably un glamorous index, yeah. isn't it? And it suggests yeah. that they're interested in more than just mm -hmm. it, the indexical function of the words. They're mm -hmm. saying something, mm -hmm. you know, pretty and, profound. And about I think it goes to your point that gold emphasizes the sacredness of the text and, and maybe both both are true. It's valuable in itself, but because it's so valuable, then it, it is appropriate to honor. Mm. Uh, I think in the case of the sacred manuscripts, it's a way of saying this is the word of God. You know, this isn't just any ordinary text. It's not any ordinary words. These are God's words, mm. and elevating it. Yeah, for the maker as well. I mean, I, I've mm. I've not used gold ink very much, but I have to say it's incredibly difficult to use to get it to flow through your brush or your pen. I mean, it's really, really tricky. I mean, Patricia Lovett makes all that kind of stuff look very easy. I mean, she's you know our best. I bet I guess our best hope of understanding how a medieval artist or scribe would have used it. But I wonder sometimes about you know the meditative function for the artisan mm. and the, or the scribe, you know, producing these texts as as well. Um, okay, so another question about, um, I think, uh, Kathleen's um, star object, the Queen Mary Psalter. Um, I think this might be unanswerable, but you oh, can have a go. Right, okay. What well, would be the cost of commissioning oh, a book gosh. like the Queen Mary Psalter written in gold today? <laughs> <laughs> More than a Ferrari? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cost questions are always difficult because we don't usually have. Uh, there's some, there's some con contemporary record. Well, a little bit, a couple of generate uh, after that of the the Lillington Missal, where we have the accounts from Westminster Abbey, and the book still um, survives. Mm. And there, it's also complicated because the scribe got room and board, and I think four <laughs> pounds a year yeah. to, so it, it, yeah. he wasn't just paid to do that, but the images were, were paid for separately. Yeah. But something like um, that book, which is, it's also made by the Queen Mary Master after, and every single illustration by the same artist, it must have taken a very 
long time. Yeah, and it, it was not a cheap. In the uh, end, I think one of the job. things we have so few records explaining how um, the you know the cost of the scribe, the cost of the parchment, yeah, the cost yeah. of the materials. But I think actually, what the impression that you get is it's actually the cost of the of the maker, you know, yes, you know, yes, and the yes. parchment is that 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 would have been the the main driver for cost. But but these kinds the of manuscripts, well, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That you know, you uh, probably, I mean, for some of the books in this exhibition, you probably have the artisans resident in your palace or yes, yes, castle exactly. or whatever for the period of time yes. making them. They're just so highly bespoke. But I think we all wish that we knew more about mm. about the about it's sort of about the price tag to. Mm be a bit mm. Jessie J. Mm. <laughs> but it's not about the price tag, which mm. is what she would explain if she was on this panel, <laughs> I think. Um, so uh, another question that I'm sure everybody, um, well, we probably have some insights from the films, but really it's about the, the object that you most enjoyed working with or that you were the most astonished by, that you learned the most about. I wonder if you each have a kind of, a thing that you knew you wanted to have in the show, but it, this gave you an opportunity to, to learn about it in a, in a way that you, um, that you had hadn't anticipated. Is that a bit of a mean one? I mean, your, your top favorite is another way, I think, of putting the same question. Well, I'm going to ans answer it in reverse because mm -hmm. I think it would be, I think I've talked about my powers, in, but you saw on the back mm -hmm. of, in, in your background, mm -hmm. something, well, you knew about it, but this amazing Vermont, that, uh, which is a grant of a of a, a title, honor, of an honor to an Englishwoman on um, silk and then covered with gold and inscriptions and mm. it's it's just so... I mean, it's, it's ridiculously it sumptuous. And I mean, it has everything that you could possibly want, like yeah. an embroidered parasol on oh, it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, because it, it, it's not just the gold on that object. It's the, mm. it's, it's set into this mm. extraordinary mm. silk mm. textile and... Yes. Yeah, yes. So we're, we are all looking at it as we speak, yeah. and we hope that you'll yeah. come to the exhibition Sorry, everybody. You'll and, have to and, come. and see it too. Um, but it's over two meters high. It's a firman from um, Shah Alam II, the Mughal Emperor, uh, in, issued in 1789 to um, Sophia Plowden, who is an English woman um, who was resident in India at the time. Her husband was an East India Company official. And Sophia was a musician who loved Indian music, so she'd attend the soirees at court. And she actually um, copied down the tunes and then transcribed them for harpsichord and published them to great acclaim in, back in England in the 1780s. Such and, a great and story. Well. Such mm -hmm. a great story. And so she was honored by the emperor for her interest in, um, in, in courtly music. And so she brought back with her to England this amazing firman which is written on paper, which has been entirely gilded behind, and then set on a piece of red silk, which has then been stamped in silver and gold and adorned with um, decorations and, the, and the, royal, the, the royal insignia of a parasol at the top. It's a mm -hmm. one, and it's in amazing condition mm -hmm. considering and how old it is. It's also, I think, an interesting object because so many of the objects here, if we know about who made them or for whom they were made, they're men, really. I mean, and this is an object that, I mean, it must have towered over the woman for <laughs> to whom it was presented. But it, it is really nice to see, the, you know, the the, um, the feminine shining through as well. Although we're also looking at a rather wonderful Tibetan manuscript, which I think also has some very powerful female deities inscribed on it as well. Um, I th any, uh, Ellie, do you have a, f a, f a maybe last word, favorite, uh, favorite uh, star object that you'd like to, to end yeah. with? So um, from going from what's probably the biggest item in the exhibition to maybe, well, one of the smallest, um, I think my favorite is the little gold girdle book, 16th century um, English manuscript in a precious gold solid gold cover it's about it could fit in your palm like this and it's designed to be worn on a girdle so um from a lady's belt uh hanging on a chain and so she could pick it up and read mm -hmm. it whenever she wanted um it contains the psalms in english verse translation um and i love it because it's a gorgeous object and it just feels so special to hold it in your hands it's just glowing and gorgeous mm. and also because I had great fun researching it because um, 
there's a tradition that it belonged to Anne Boleyn, which um, we wanted to get to the bottom of for this exhibition, because it's something that people kept asking us about. And sadly, it probably didn't belong to Anne Boleyn, <laughs> but I had a great time going through all the um, 19th and 18th century sources, trying to find out where the story came from. And the sad answer is that it came from a mix-up. Um, <laughs> scholars getting very mixed up. In, um, in that period. Well, <laughs> you've done some absolutely phenomenal research to put this exhibition together, and not all discoveries are, are what one would hope for, I suppose, but um, you've achieved so much, and I think you've made you know, an absolutely spectacular show here. And I think, it, and thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening, and I, th I just want to, I guess, finish really by thanking you, thanking the makers of the film and the other uh, curators who contributed to it, and uh, inviting everybody to come and see the show at the British Library. It's on until the 2nd of October. Um, see you here. See you at the BL. <laughs> and until then, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening.